Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations in Horror. My name is Kevin L. Powers, and I'll be your guest for this amazing adventure into the bowels of hell in terms of Valentine's Day horror. And um, this is something we're doing that's uh, different than normal because we're going to be celebrating this month, Valentine's Day, love, and all that type of stuff in horror. Uh, we're also doing uh, uh, Black History Month, so we'll be doing some films on that as well. So this is a, going to be an interesting uh, month for our show, and I'm glad you're going to be joining us. Uh, also joining us as my special guest is Sarah Panazzo. She's a, a regular on our show, and she loves to uh, talk about about all kinds of horrifying things with me, and I hope that you've been enjoying our conversations in the past. Uh, and uh, you know, welcome her for uh, this show here. So, uh, Panazzo, uh, tell everyone who may not have heard this before a little bit about yourself before we get started with this uh, week's movie. I'm Sarah. I love horror movies, and this one is an interesting set that we're doing, and it has some of the most horrific times of the year because you know. The holidays can be terrifying. All right. So, everyone, we are doing the movie Holidays, which is an anthology film that kind of encompasses uh, eight different holidays, uh, which should be very interesting. I mean, we've all seen multiple different types of anthology films. But this one here, each uh, holiday is giving a short film that's done by a different director who has uh, done several uh, horror films um, and will be probably familiar to some of the hardcore horror fans out there. I mean, even Kevin Smith from The Clerks and um, Tusk has a short in this film, so it will it, it has a little bit of everything. But uh, <laughs> to get us started, because this is an anthology film, we've not done an anthology film yet, Kind of, Panazzo, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on on anthology films in general and uh, before we get started with this film. So I love anthology films. I love anthology books where you get that, like, I have a hard time focusing on reading an entire book at once. So the short stories have always been, like, my favorite type of thing, like, gone through all the Stephen King collections, just the random horror short story collections, because you can get a little bit of everything and they can be all drastically different. Um, it's why I like the show shows like Black Mirror and uh, Twilight Zone is you basically get a tiny mini story that all revolves around the same topic occasionally. So like I love the VHS series. ABCs of Death was a great anthology series as well. Um, but yeah, we just it's fun to go back and forth with them, whether they all have something together or not. So I'm also a big fan of anthology films, and I do enjoy the uh, anthology films that have themes in them sometimes. Uh, other times, I like the ones that have absolutely no theme other than allowing a director or writer to go crazy with the concepts. Uh, that's one of the things I loved about the three and three extremes uh, films. But uh, I also enjoyed the VHS. I'm a huge fan of the VHS. They're so right. much fun. I'm glad they've brought them back the last couple of years. Yes, I am too. I'm glad that Shudder has gone out the way and uh, done those. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, anthology films out there that will hopefully eventually get through because everything from Christmas, uh, a Christmas horror story. And uh, I think they did, uh, what was they? Uh, all the Creatures Are Stirring, creatures I think was the Christmas one. Yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of them out there now. And um, Holidays is one of the few that I can think of that decided to do a short based on each one of the holidays so we're gonna get started with that uh this is gonna be a little different because there are so many different stories in this one we may go through each of the different stories uh in terms of plot and trying to decipher our likes and dislikes between each of the stories which is not what we currently do with any of the other films so this one will be interesting for us but that being said, we might as well get started with the first one, which was uh, what was the first one? What's the first one? Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day, which is what this whole thing is about. Valentine's Day, so it's a great way to start off the episode. Uh, Valentine's Day. What were your thoughts on Valentine's Day? I thought it was so interesting and funny, and a lot of these had like little bits of subtle humor in them, um, and this one just had phenomenal lighting like it was very dramatic when they were under the water and when she had the like zoom in romance scene where it got really cheesy and I just thought it was super hysterical and precious and then leading up to the 
the end where she is literally offering him a heart at the door <laughs> i mean it's like it's what you give on valentine's day is you give something that's a heart you give him your valentine and i i guess that's one way to do it so uh when i rewatched the film i actually saw this the valentine's day uh short as a or segment as a different type of film altogether uh when i rewatched it, i started to see a lot of parallels to the movie uh brian De palma's carrie with the character uh, yes the main character i can't remember her name offhand uh maxi uh, maxi remember Max. that they make they keep calling her maxi pad yeah they keep calling her maxi pad and one of the opening scenes is all these other girls who are picking on her and i started when they did the whole thing with the maxi pad maxi pad i kept thinking of the opening scene to carrie where they're saying plug it up plug it up and it's all these bullies against this one girl fun uh, fact the uh I guess the I wasn't paying attention to it, but I noticed it online today is the uh, what's the like the the hat things that they wear when they're swimming, the like hair protectors. Yeah, the 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 cap, the cap. So apparently they are all set to be the same colors where one is rainbow like the girls were in Carrie in that same scene. <laughs> see i i saw that you know, and even when they're in the locker room scene uh when all the other bullies are around the main bully they all look like characters from they Kids do now. and i didn't notice that the first time i saw that. i was like it's now that i've seen it the second time it was it was blatant then <laughs> um and which is which makes that segment a little bit more enjoyable to watch or, or some of the the carry references to the Brian De Palma version versus the other versions that have been made since then, because it's been remade, I think, twice now, and a sequel, so. Yeah, because, I mean, like, the, that zoom-in of her face um, when she's, like, the love-struck teenager where it's very manic, that's also very similar to that one shot in Carrie where she's, like, smiling as the with the crown on at the uh, the dance, and it just, she looks so manic no matter what. So it's it's very interesting. Well, you may bring up something else, you know, the way it was lit. Uh, it, and there's a lot of red in this film. It yes. It goes with Valentine's. And then the swimsuit costumes. And, of mm -hmm. course, when they're running, uh, when the main bully and Max are running through the woods, uh, the main bully has the red bow in her head. The red plays a... Red is color. everywhere. And in in it actually does in some of the other ones too. Color does too, but this time when I watched it, I was very um, I, I noticed a lot of these details that I didn't the first time I watched it, uh, and that's what made this film a little bit more enjoyable. Is because I you know some of the stories in and of themselves are not the best mm -hmm. <laughs> stories, uh, but some of the concepts that the filmmaker used to bring the story across were actually very interesting. Yeah, and speaking of similarities between the couple, I never realized until I started taking notes how many of these stories have, like, the missing father aspect, which don't know why, but <laughs> cool. <laughs> it, it, it brings up something. I would kind of wonder if any of the filmmakers uh, were were all together in terms of trying to figure out the stories and if there is any type of link between the stories. I know sometimes that does happen. Uh, but not always. I know with the three extreme movies, there is absolutely no link whatsoever to the filmmakers. They all had a complete control over what the heck they were making, and then they just threw these films together, mostly to show uh, a filmmaker from different countries. So each segment is by a director from a different country, whereas this one, uh, there are uh, segments that are from the other countries, but I wonder if there was any type of cohesiveness between all the filmmakers who put it together yeah I could find very little about like the actual making of this and I don't know if it was like they reached out to everybody and said hey this is your theme this is what we're doing or if they just happened to find people who were making holiday themed shorts and just requested them to send them in <laughs> well you know the quality between the, all of them are completely different I'm, I'm yes we haven't gotten to my boy Kevin Smith's uh, film yet, but his seems like he just did his on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Whereas something like this one, you had to have a lot of cinematography and color and stuff. Yeah, you had a lot of production quality compared to yeah. the Halloween one. <laughs> 
Uh, any other thoughts on uh, Valentine's between before we move on to the next one? Um, the only other big thing that I got from this was that the two directors from this just did the newest Pet Cemetery, the one in 2019. Oh, nice. So it's it was interesting. I did a, a dive for each director, and all of these people were pretty unknown in 2016. They've done a couple of little things here and there. But then a lot of them only recently hit it big with the like A list, B list movies. Mm. I'm not surprised. Uh, Kevin Smith was the one I knew the most of when I originally. Yeah, saw it. and I think that's why I originally watched it is I knew Kevin Smith had a thing in there, and I definitely stayed for the other movies. Yeah, well, I'm thinking I've only seen. I've still only seen, I think, four of the movies from the directors that they mention. Um, like on the poster, they mentioned the directors that are associated with film, and I've only, I've still only seen four of the movies there. Um, I, I, have, I have to I have some mm. horror films to go out there and watch. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I think I've seen a few of these. I think I've seen maybe one from each. Hmm. So uh, if for those who have never seen the poster for Holidays, uh, they they advertise it by the directors of Dracula Untold, Dark mm -hmm. Skies, Tusk, Starry Eyes, The Midnight Swim, The Pact, and Some Kind of Hate, uh, if you've never seen the poster. I actually really like the poster because uh, the character on the poster is like a mixture of all the different holidays. I thought it was very clever. <laughs> um, it's, for me, it's uh, it's the biggest selling point of it. I think Bef when I heard about the movie, I just heard about an anthology film that's encompassing all these different holidays. I was like, okay, another anthology movie. Uh, but when I saw the poster, it's like, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. Let me uh, check this out. Um, some of these films I've heard of, um, I've actually heard of all of the films, but only some of them I'd seen. I think the only one I had not heard of before actually viewing the film was The Midnight Swim, which I still haven't seen yet, but I need to go out there and watch it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, like I said, like, there were some directors who before this hadn't done much, but then afterwards they've they've done quite a few things. Yeah. Uh, so I was pleasantly surprised with some of these. Well, that's good because I know that in theory, a lot of uh, anthology movies start off like that. I mean, uh, what was it? Uh, ABC's of Death used tons of no name or relatively new directors to direct each one of those little segments. Uh, yes. I think that's a great st uh, stepping stepping stone for a lot of directors who are just trying to find their feet in the door in terms of getting real jobs <laughs> yeah because like in the last 10 years with the influx of i would say more creative horror mm -hmm. um or it's not just the the jump scare movies over and over again like we get some pretty original ideas or some really good remakes like the invisible man and you look back and they've all done one of these um, collections of films, whether it's a VHS or it's ABCs of Death or even this. So it's always interesting to look back and be like, oh, I really loved that one. And like the guy who did The Night House, I believe, did the um, the siren one in the first VHS. Yeah. And he it's like. Version, I believe, too. Yeah. And I was like. That one was probably one of my favorites in that collection. No wonder I love this movie. So it's it's interesting looking back on these people. <laughs> uh, well, it used to be that, you know, you had stars before they were stars as starring in a horror movie. And now you have all these horror directors who start off doing anthology films before they mm -hmm. move on to something bigger and better. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next one, which is St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> this one was so much fun and it was so ugh. <laughs> pregnancy is a scary thing for women and the whole giving birth to a snake thing was very ugh. i was worried it was gonna like alien chest burster out of her yeah at one point but i'm i'm glad it did not go that way and then it was really cute when it was born and it had danny zuko hair so i mean how can you not like that giant snake so <laughs> I did see vibes of uh, Rosemary's baby in this in this one here. I mean, they uh, even mentioned <laughs> that at some point. It's uh, I wrote it down. Uh, what did they say? Have you ever seen Rosemary's baby? Well, replace baby with reptile. <laughs> <Rosemary's> reptile. <laughs> 
And you know, it it, it it's one of those things where the, when I when I saw the film the first time, I thought it was really creepy because the little girl was freaking creepy as hell. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she's really creepy as hell, and I know them using the snakes, and, it, and visually, there's the the snake pattern, um, and with the ropes and everything like that. Yeah, uh, it was really cool. But you're right. By the time they get to the very end, it becomes this cute little movie with the yeah. with baby, uh, in in the forest, out <laughs> of the forest with everyone dancing around with this giant snake. Uh, I hate to say that I hope that she went back together again after giving birth to a freaking 15 feet snake. Uh, but uh, it's a it's a it's one of the more unusual endings to the stories in this anthology. Most of them have not so good of, of an ending. Yeah, like this was a very happy ending where they were like, well, she'll never love this child. And she's like, no, he's beautiful. <laughs> Well, because she only wanted a child, she now got one. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about like monkey's paw esque stories, this is very much of yeah, you get pregnant, but it's with a paganistic snake. And I also thought it was really funny that when they do the school book reports, the little girl actually writes a similar story. She chose uh, the story of Prince Lindworm which is basically the same thing. A queen who couldn't have kids <laughs> seeks advice from a crone and is supposed to like eat two different flowers, one for one thing, one for the other, but she accidentally eats both because she couldn't remember which one was which. So she <laughs> gives birth to a giant snake guy thing that eventually turns into a prince. So it's also a happy ending. Oh my God. <laughs> but uh, what were your thoughts on this one? <laughs> I thought it was really well done finding out afterwards that this is the guy who did Dracula Untold. Mm -hmm. Um I was like, okay, so yeah, it does have that really nice production quality, not as good as like the first one. Like it was slightly B-movie-ish, but the story itself was so well done. The acting was pretty impressive, especially like you said with the little girl and how oh. creepy she was. Um but yeah, I mean, overall, it had a, a lot of moments like where it kept showing the different dates and then finding yeah. out at like day 396, <laughs> she's finally giving birth to this thing. Um, but yeah, it had a lot of nice, like beautiful shots in it uh, with like the field with the sun and all of the pagan people in their animal mix. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is, it starts off as this very isolated uh, story that's in like school setting, yeah. and it goes to this really open field with the paganistic uh, stuff. Which, well, <laughs> I, I I had some echoes of The Wicker Man when I was watching this again. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> oh yeah, because to be honest with you, we don't see a whole lot of paganistic movies being done. No, like one every three to five years that gets noticed. Um, and it's always refreshing to see that those ideals are still relevant. Wicker Man is still one of my favorites, and it's you know there's there's some other ones that are really great out there. I'm, I'm trying to remember them all, but <laughs> uh, I can't for some reason. I, there was one in which this group of men are going on a uh, on a on a kind of a, a trek, and they get stuck in this little town that's kind of paganistic, and I can't remember what it's called. Uh, uh, save my life. I think it's actually by the same guy who did uh, uh, Siren. <laughs> but it was a really great movie about uh, this pagan town, and it's something that, for some reason, doesn't get done enough. These type of ideals that people other than the norm have, whether it's trying to replenish the, the their, their crops or, or appease some type of uh, pagan god, or something like this, where... <laughs> They all worship this snake god thing. Yeah. No, I always love going to religious horror. Like, uh, uh, because I, I grew up like Catholic Christian and seeing the equivalences between vampirism and uh, the, the rising of Christ on Easter is a very interesting concept. Um, but yeah, like St. Maud. I mean, you get into like the omen where you get that bit of religion in there. Uh, it all gets to be very interesting, especially when you can look at it from other religions. Mm -hmm. 
So the thing is, you bring up a, a, a nice element that I keep forgetting about is that at the end of the movie, you see the girl in a, a, a Christian school about to do the same thing to a, a Yeah, nun. I think it's a nun. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> very, very interesting that you brought that little religious aspect up. <laughs> All right. So uh, what is what was the third movie? The third one was Easter, which is probably my favorite because, yet again, it is religious horror <laughs> in the best way possible. Because, you know, as a kid, you don't understand the difference of, well, what does the Easter bunny have to do with Jesus coming back from the dead? And the little girl talking about it where she's like, are they the same? Is <laughs> What happens if he sees me? What happens if Jesus sees me? What happens if the Easter bunny sees me? And it's like... It's like a kid's fever dream. It it's, is. It's so, and the fact that it's hinted at that the dad disappeared the year before because of the same thing is really terrifying. Well, the whole movie is terrifying. And then, of course, the the ideal at the very end where we see the little girl turning into the next Easter bunny. Yeah. Uh, it's it's tragic. It's, it, it's a tragic thing. But then you kind of like, She'll never see her mother again, but maybe she'll see her father. Yeah, maybe she'll see her dad. It'll be great. But no, the whole, uh, if you don't like body horror, like I can do like pierced skin and stuff like that. A skin bunny as a human dressed up as Jesus is reaching a little too far. It's one of those like things that like you don't want to see and then you can't look away. <laughs> and then you've got the the holes in the hands where the baby chicks are coming out of it and everything and i was just like <laughs> i was just waiting for something else to happen else and then happen. she just like looks through the hole in his hand yeah. and transforms and i was like Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> well that's the thing this the, the whole anthology series this one touches on a little bit of everything and you know you have religion in here you know you you, you know and that's uh, that adds to the actual aspect not of this, just this segment, but of the whole film, um, because it's not just a throwaway stories. They're trying to tell you other things. St. Patrick's Day has this whole thing about, you know, paganism mm -hmm. uh, and pregnancy and a woman who couldn't get pregnant before then. And of course, um, the, the, the first one, Valentine's, is a bully uh, or a, a woman who's being bullied and the one teacher who decides to give her a little bit of uh, uh of of uh, what's the perfect word for that uh attention mm -hmm. thinking it's not too much but enough so that she's not completely bullied because he could have stopped the bullying at any time well and that was that's one of the little subplots of that one is he doesn't want to stop the bully because the bully put together the talent show that's supposed to be the fundraiser for his heart surgery huh? <laughs> and then it's it's a little ironic that that bully's heart is the one she offers up to him to like, I mean, that's not how that works, <laughs> but nice try. It's the thought that counts. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, in, in Valentine, the, the coach is having a horrible relationship with his wife or girlfriend. I don't know if they actually tell you which is which, um, but she, he, you know, all, there are, every time you hear them, they're always arguing uh, about, you know, she's not celebrating Valentine's on Valentine's and, she doesn't care about his the fundraiser to fix his heart and shit. So, it, you know, these themes that run through at least these three for right now uh, are are very, you know, they're not very, they're, they're not items that could just be thrown away when you watch them. Uh, this is not just a, a film that's just trying to create scary stories. It's trying yeah. to. Yeah. They're not one sided. There's they're multifaceted. There you go. Not one sided, but multifaceted. Correct. <laughs> All right. I'm going from Easter, although I will have to say I love the fucking uh, makeup and creature effects. It's, in Easter. it's uh, so good. So good. Uh, this is a creepy fucking monster, and you would never think of that for a freaking Easter bunny. And it's pretty. Uh, I I have to commend the filmmakers for the for that one. Um, you're you're right. This is one of my favorite sequences, only because at by the time you get to the end of it, with the girl transforming into the Easter bunny, and she's been told she'll never see her mother again. That's a that 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 stays with you because you don't actually see her or her final transformation. You just see her 
transform and it's almost done i i, I would say animated style really yeah shadows and i thought that was a brilliant uh decision by the filmmakers yeah it's i always go to the fact that everything's a lot more horrifying in your imagination mm -hmm. and the less you see the better and yeah. you can only imagine how horrific her transformation is <laughs> all right getting on to number four in the film is mother's day, mother's day. <laughs> all right tell me a little bit about what you thought about mother's day um i thought it was an interesting concept <laughs> a woman who can get pregnant every time she has sex <laughs> but then you throw in the whole like witch's coven and you get the whole like maiden mother crone aspect of their little ritual and then i i was even shocked that they named the guy and the thing at the end as Montezuma and Montezuma 2 according to the credits and I was like I have no idea how this ties into Mother's Day but okay I guess we'll go with it uh I this is one of the ones I didn't care for as much um only it's a, it's the a story that's a, a visually interesting story but I just yes uh, I, and I like the ideal of the of the woman who's 24 who every time she has sex she uh, gets pregnant. But the ideal is she goes to a place that is supposed to help her, but it ends up being a place for women who can't get pregnant. And that means there's some type of larger conspiracy at hand that sent her there to begin with. And I, you know, I, I would think that her regular doctor you know would have saw this uh, more than just the, the what the 20 pregnancies ago or something uh it just seemed a little bit weird to me um i would have like it, this one this one just was uh, an odd one for me and the fact that it's all about the 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 mother's day aspects i just i'm not i'm not sure because visually it's a really interesting film, especially when you get into the fact that it's all these women who are trying to do this weird little ritual, which I didn't figure out what the fuck the ritual exactly was because it just seemed like they were drugging her. She's pregnant. It's not like Rosemary's Baby where she was impregnated by someone else. So whatever ritual they're trying to do, they're trying to change the baby or something like that. Uh, maybe I need to rewatch. Yeah, like I wasn't. No, I, I took it as a, uh, so like all the other women couldn't have children. So I was like, is, are they trying to transfer this woman's like energy to the other women so she can like transfer the child over or what's going on? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a beautifully shot piece. The ending, the payoff is not worth the entire plot of the story. And you're, it's just the one shot cut that yeah. you're like, what is this? <laughs> Um, but I did think it was interesting that this director, she's pretty big on writing for TV. She's done a bunch of different, um, pilot episodes that have gotten TV series off the ground. Um, so she's been pretty big. Her most recent one is lessons in chemistry. Um, but each of the witches in the coven have like a semi-decent acting career. Whereas, uh, I think the most popular one out of them right now is one of them was the girl in a girl walks home alone at night which is also another phenomenal uh horror movie um and she's currently in the snow piercer tv show but uh because i was like i recognize these people i just can't remember <laughs> what from where, where from yeah and i love a girl walks home alone that's <laughs> so good that one yeah that was so good we'll talk about that one we'll have to put that one on our list yes <laughs> that absolutely was uh, but yeah, I was like, huh, I mean, it's good that you told me about this whole Montezuma 2 thing. I just thought it was fucking weird uh, when a, a, a giant full length arm came out of her vagina yes. as she was giving birth to. I was like, that's because I really didn't want them to be sucking her energy out so that all the other women would be getting pregnant. I kind of did see the story going that way and it did this, and I was like, huh. Yeah, like, I don't know if they were going to, like, Montezuma's Revenge or what they were going towards. Because, you know, you see that in quite a few different movies where you get, like, an Aztec god or goddess coming out. But this didn't, th this coven didn't seem like 
that kind of religion. I wasn't sure exactly what they were going towards. I didn't either. Uh, like I said, I could have. Uh, my idea behind what they were doing is that they want this one woman that comes in their midst who can have, who gets pregnant every time she has sex. They're trying to. I thought I really did thought, think they was going to siphon off that energy to all the other women who are at this camp, and it, it would be something else. Uh, <laughs> so you're right. The payoff for me in this one didn't didn't really gel. Um, this is why this is one of my what I think is the weaker ones of this whole anthology. But like I said, I could watch it again and see a different aspect uh, later on if I was to rewatch it again. Yeah, I mean, there there's definitely another story here. I can definitely see them turning this into a full length thing to explore <laughs> what was going on because we we totally missed part of this story. <laughs> It was it, it was left on the cutting room floor. So if they're if the filmmakers are listening to us, I was like, there's something missing for this. It just didn't something didn't fully gel. Yeah. So okay, all right. So the fifth one uh, we'll go to is Father's Day. Uh, <laughs> what did you think about Father's Day? I really enjoyed this one. It was quite haunting. It was quite different from the rest mm -hmm. um, because you just get these beautifully framed shots of this woman like at first I thought she was being stalked and that's what the package was and then it turns out it's a recording from her dad made on the day of the last day she saw him to the point that she hears herself as a child in the recording um and I thought there were some beautiful shots there's the weird thing with the clips going on that it's like okay so this is like a this is like a weird it's another weird god goddess thing or some kind of um cosmic monster mm. ah, um, because yeah at the end where she crossed it like he makes the comment about you are choosing to mm -hmm. come here i was like okay is this like a vampire thing and then she crosses the line of salt by the door and it's like okay something is being kept in here and i don't know if it's him or if it's the thing he went to go see but ah. it is it is such a beautifully shot piece. And I thought it was really funny that uh, she's actually probably one of the biggest actresses in this movie. And the dad who's recording it is Bert from Tremors. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't put that together until my husband mentioned something. And I was like, that changes all of this. This is definitely a comedy now. <laughs> so I have to add this. The only reason why I recognize that now is because I literally just watched Tremors like three days ago and then I watched this one uh yeah uh, two days ago. I was like, wait a second, these voices are familiar to me. <laughs> uh so it's funny that you actually caught it too, because I didn't catch it the first time I saw it either. Uh but I only caught it because I literally just watched Tremors like three days ago. <laughs> yeah, and then she I've seen her in quite a few things apparently. So she was in Dr. Sleep. She was young Lorraine in Insidious 2. She's the lead in The House of the Devil, which is another beautifully shot film. Oh, um, she's in The Burrowers, I Trapped the Devil, and then she did 2018's All the Creatures Were Stirring. So oh. she's she's done quite a few horror movies. Um, but yeah, it was... I gotta say, it was one of my favorites just because of the way it's shot. It's just a beautiful piece. It's very heartfelt. Um, I was waiting for the mom to be on the phone and be like, no, we had a funeral for your dad. He's dead. Who the hell are you talking to? But uh, yeah, Well, the thing is, until you mentioned it, I didn't even think about that being uh, at the doorway where she crosses into the house to be in salt. And that changes my ideals uh, about that whole thing. Um I don't know what the eclipse is for, but you put, hit on something that was very interesting to me uh, in regards to that could be some type of otherworldly uh, god, um, something like that. Uh, when I rewatch it again, I'll have to keep that in mind because that's actually very interesting to think about. Because I've the, the two times I've seen the movie, I've, it's like, why are these these images of the eclipse? Uh, I, yeah. I, I wasn't really getting it. Uh, I, th I thought it was visually cool as shit. Uh, we cut back and forth from this eclipse that's about to happen. Uh, but I, I, I didn't pick up on what it meant for the story or the pillar of salt. But that changes my aspect on it now. <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't even sure. Like, they showed that room like three or four times that she was standing in. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that door wasn't there. And it 
possibly only opens during the eclipse mm -hmm. because then you get transported to this other place because it's not inside it's outside going back inside to another house mm -hmm. um so it's it was very interesting and the fact that they did like all of the sounds next to these empty places like you can hear her stick on the chain link fence but she's not doing anything or you hear the busyness inside that building when it's now empty uh it was very well shot and well recorded yeah so that's another aspect of this one that i really liked i really liked the 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 um you we would really call it the 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 sound effects yeah the sound design uh, the sound editing, um for this one this one it because you're right it does stand out in this film and it makes it a little bit more creepy as the story goes on because a lot of what she's doing is listening to the recording that she got uh who she thinks is her father uh, and this is the odd thing about this movie being that it's really about the daughter and her father and not so much Father's Day, so to speak, unless there's an eclipse on Father's Day. And that's how you work. I don't know if they actually did they actually mention anything about Father's Day in this film? Because when she opens that. the package, it says Happy Father's Day. Uh, OK. okay. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it was supposed to be exactly Father's Day or if it was supposed to be like a birthday gift to her. For me, it works either way because my yeah. birthday is normally on Father's Day every year. So I was like, this is a little creepy. I mean, my dad's alive, so I know this can't happen, but. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, th this one I think was uh, kind of like um, Easter is very creepy in the fact that the, the atmosphere it creates and the unexpectedness by the yes. time the very end of the film um i think that's what makes these two very effective in terms of uh the the, the segments yeah they're both very effective short films yeah. like they tell you everything you need to know to get the point of the story well i'll have to rewatch it again because now that i have a new idea in terms of the whole eclipse thing i have to rewatch it with that in mind uh, and that's what I love about uh, our little conversations. You, you give me more more reason to rewatch these movies again and again. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, moving along. Oh, any final thoughts about Father's Day before we move on? No, I mean it's like we said. It's it's a wonderfully shot piece. It's wonderfully recorded for audio. Um, artistic wise, I think it's probably my favorite out of all of these. Okay. Okay. Um, next up is Halloween. Uh, <laughs> uh, everyone else can't see the look of your face, but I definitely can. Um, I, <laughs> I wanted your opinions on this one first before I say anything about this one. So I think this one was originally why I wanted to watch it is I was on a Kevin Smith kick. I think this was, uh, right around, was this around the time he did Tusk? I'm assuming since they were advertising Tusk, I think. Then probably. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we were like, okay, Kevin Smith decided to do a bunch of horror movies. Cool, let's let's watch them. And so we threw this on, and I was like, this is just an entire ad showcasing his daughter and nothing else. <laughs> I mean, it's got his comedy, and, like, the rest of this movie can be really funny at times, but these puns are, like, awful dad puns that an 18 year old girl is supposed to be saying and it's like it really is shot like a bad porn the entire time so i i think it's supposed to be shot like a bad porn because it's you know it's it, it it's the whole uh uh porn cam thing it's, it's not porn though it's, it's just not. a camera <laughs> Uh, but uh, cause they're cam girls, and he's and Ian's supposed to be the pimp that with ponytails. I this <laughs> I'm I'm sure Kevin Smith had an ideal for what he wanted to accomplish in this film. Uh I don't think the comedy hits the way it's supposed to hit, and I'm not sure if that's because of the writing or if the delivery. Uh, because. A lot of this seems like it would have been something in a bad 80s porno film. Yeah. That's something in the film that would be made nowadays. Well, uh, and it's it's also like a bunch of actors that are friends with him and that he's like one of the girls. Uh, I think it's the one who's dressed up as Dorothy was actually a PA on a couple of his films. And now she's a 
production manager, production supervisor for film. But uh, and then like the guy is um, the creator of Epic Meal Time, and I was like, oh, that's where I know him from. I couldn't see past the douchiness. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I I can't. The ideal by the end of the film, where the three women get their one up on their pimp. I'm gonna say yes. pimp in, uh, and then they take over the business. I like that aspect of the story. I didn't really like the way to get to that part of the story. I thought, I thought the uh, actual concept between the three girls, which is the coven of, yeah, women, as described in the little cartoon. The cartoon. Watch- yeah, I thought they were going to lean more into that. And so I was really disappointed. And especially after, like, this is a couple years after Trick or Treat came out, which is probably my favorite anthology of all time. <laughs> I I love that, the rules of Halloween. Like, I, I don't think you can live up to that, with <laughs> especially this short. <laughs> yeah, I think if I think if this one had been given a little bit more time and Kevin Smith had been allowed to to kind of extrapolate his ideals into a longer form uh, with, a- with I hate to say this out loud, but actual actors, <laughs> uh, I think it would have been uh, a much better realized film. Uh, that being said, as of right now, it's one of the weakest in the anthology, which is the number one reason why I kind of wanted to see it was his film and yeah. it being one of the weakest in the entire film overall. <laughs> But it is funny. It is funny that the three ladies get over on their pimp by putting a vibrator up his ass and gluing his ass shut. Gluing it shut and then attaching it to a car battery because what better way to do that? And I'm sitting there like, they'd have to be like smart engineers to be able to rig that. That's not something anybody can do because it's not like you just plug it into the car battery. So this is like... Uh, electrical engineer worthy like why are they wasting their time doing webcams if they can do that I also didn't really believe that they would be able to do that <laughs> uh, all the all the dialogue leading up to that does not make you think that they could do this no uh, plus uh, <laughs> plus you're right the douchebaggy and uh, you would think even if his ass was glued together he'd just pull the fucking vibrator out or yeah. the cable going to the damn vibrator. They literally give him a knife. Like, okay, so you might be electrocuted or you're going to be vibrated in the ass until you die. <laughs> like... <laughs> when I was re-watching it, the, the, the actual logic behind the whole story kind of just got thrown out the window. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, this ended up being one of my weaker ones. And that's, those are my thoughts in this one. I was like, oh. Yeah, he, he gave him a knife. He just cut the damn cable. And yeah. Like, go to the hospital, have them open your ass up, and take the vibrator out. Or something. And I mean, like, the way that super glue works, I get he might have a very hairy ass, which would be quite painful, but, like, people get waxed there for those reasons. And if he actually had on the sign, like, no bush on the tush as one of the rules in the house. So it's like... If he followed that rule, it wouldn't be an issue. You're right. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so we're laughing our asses off talking about the movie. So maybe Kevin Smith did achieve his goal. But yeah, I- maybe, okay. maybe he got exactly what he wanted. I mean, it's not Tusk because that is just horrifying. Uh, but you know what? I have not seen Tusk yet. I keep <laughs> I've kid- I-, I know what the whole movie is about. But I've been kind of avoiding that one uh, until I'm in the mood to watch that type of movie. Yeah, I they hadn't released the image on the internet, and I think we got to that part, and I noped the hell right out of there, and I don't think we ever finished it, because after seeing that one shot... No. Okay, now I have to put that higher up on my list to watch. Maybe we'll discuss that in a later episode. Oh, yeah, God. I I don't know if I can, Kevin. Oh well, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything bad about uh, Kevin Smith because he has done some excellent movies and oh yeah, absolutely. Some of his horror films are really good. Yeah, he's uh, just one... not who I think of when you talk about Kevin Smith. You think Clerks and um, All Rats. 
mall rats and all of those, you don't think about his horror that much. Nah, I mean, but I will tell everyone right off the bat that Red State is one of my favorite films that he's ever done. So if you haven't seen that horror film, go out and see that one. That was excellent. But yeah, I'm. I'm... Yeah. No, <laughs> I love Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back because you know it's got Mark Hamill in it. How can you not like it? <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh my god, I haven't seen that in forever. Um, that is an excellent movie too. That and Dogma, another weird religion movie that's done so well. Oh my god, yeah, he needs to do. I think he needs to do more horror stuff. He seems to like it. Hopefully, yeah. he'll do some more. Red State is, I thought, was great. Um, Tusk, I like body horror, but the image of Walrus Man, I, yeah. I, mean, I have, I have to be in the mood for that one. Sorry. This one I could take a little bit more with the vibrator of the butt. I actually think the guy Ian deserves the vibrator of the butt. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's my that's my thought <laughs> on uh, on that one. I just as a Halloween segment, I just didn't think it worked as well as it. No. Could. Um, especially considering the Halloween when people think it was of, like oh, I said earlier, it was. Yeah. Uh, anthology films, people thinking about Halloween, there have been so many great ones out there that you needed to up the ante on that in order to be uh, effective. So, Yeah. Like Christmas and Halloween are the two holiday anthologies people most do. So, yeah. All right. Moving on. Is... Speaking of which is Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Christmas. Now, this one, this this one, uh, I I actually liked only because uh, I love Seth Green and uh, him him playing the under 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 underdog in this one was actually kind of funny. Yeah, I love Seth Green. Uh, like going back to like anything he has been in, I think I've seen most of his work because you know, as a kid of the '90s, he was in everything. Everything. <laughs> I did think it was funny that his real life wife is the wife in this. Oh, um, I didn't know I, that really. I didn't know that until I looked up the the cast and I was like, okay, that makes us 10 times funnier. <laughs> it does make it funnier. Oh, I did not know that was his wife. That is so so interesting. <laughs> so I have to ask. So the the goggles, you put them yes. on, right? The kid sees what he wants to be, right? <laughs> and then we see Seth Green with what he wants to be and then he sees the perspective of the dead guy. Were we seeing his wife's perspective of her actually doing that, or was that what she wanted to do? See, that's the thing. That's the anti. That's the uh, concept. It, it, it's supposed to be your best you. Uh, it shows the it, you know. So <laughs> uh, whether or not she actually has killed someone, uh, she really wants to kill someone if she hasn't already. Um, and he is someone who just accidentally killed someone. <laughs> <laughs> for a toy <laughs> uh but you know when his wife sees what he saw and we're assuming she saw exactly what he saw in the uh, in the goggles she absolutely loved the fact yes. that he let someone die um Take, yeah because he was tired of being stepped all over and he was like yeah. no but i was like this is the evil version of jingle all the way <laughs> <laughs> if jingle all the way was a horror movie this would be it <laughs> You know, that's absolutely correct. I had never, I did not think about that because I haven't seen Jingle all the way in probably. We watched it three times this year. I don't know why. Well, I know why my husband loves Arnold. It is his favorite person in the world. Ah, I haven't seen that movie since it originally came out. I don't remember when it came out. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh my God. But you're absolutely correct. This would be the uh, the horror version of Jingle all the way. I, I, did, I did like the concept of them doing that type of horror film of people yeah. her racing for the it toy for their kids and of course seth green's character misses out and just reluctantly is able to get it from the guy who has a heart attack or something and eventually dies uh <laughs> well and then thinking uh so this was back in like what this was made in 2016 uh i don't think the black mirror episode was out yet that had a very similar Concept. thing where everybody has the like eye goggles thing and it's the couple oh, yeah. having sex um and they're both seeing different versions of their favorite time and i was like this is it's an interesting concept because it could be a thing at some point so i'm gonna go really 
old school. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, which worked on the same concept, but a different way. Uh, it's the movie Strange Days that James Cameron wrote for Catherine Bigelow. No. If you haven't seen the movie Strange Days, as Ray Fiennes and Angela Bassett, and Ray Fiennes plays a, I guess, a, a seller of actual real memories that people live off of other people's real memories. So he sells these memories that are created in a virtual world to other people who want them. So they're living other people's real memories. Uh, and so obviously someone, the, the concept is someone is wearing one of these uh, squids on their heads that records a cop killing um, a, another person. And then they're all trying to get after this memory that's in Ray Fiennes' possession. Then Angela Bassett's an ass-kicking woman, of course, so she kicks everyone's ass, and it's a great movie. Uh, Ray Fiennes in a non-dramatic role, or he <laughs> hasn't become Voldemort yet, so in the Harry Potter movie, so he's still relatively new. Most people don't even realize he's in the movie because he wasn't nobody. I think he'd only done uh, the English patient then. But the concept of people living out other people's fantasies in VR, or the concept of being able to see your real you, is what that movie kind of touches upon. And this is, I don't remember how old this movie, this movie's gotta be like probably almost 30 years, 30 years ago or some shit. Um, and we saw it in Black Mirror and we see it here and the concept keeps coming up and I'm surprised we're not so, uh, there yet. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get that way in like, uh, what is, who's the author who did like, uh, do electric sheep dream? Oh, uh, the Phil K. Dick. Yeah, so it's, it's all like that kind of stuff, which is really interesting. So Strange Days came out in 95. Good God, I'm old. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, one of James Cameron's uh, earlier films that he did, that he wrote. Um, and it was amazingly done because uh, anyone who's ever read anything that James Cameron wrote, uh, he overwrites. So he explains yeah. all the technology. He, if you've ever read anything he's read, all the technology he wrote is that it is real and so when you're watching the movie you believe that all this shit is possible right now um i believe virtual reality was still in its infancy in 95 so mm -hmm. he took the concept and ran with it nowadays we use it as a game and, yeah. or exercise because there's a lot of programs out there now using it as uh an exercise motif and of course you know uh teaching and stuff like that well, and there was actually, we were just talking about it the other day, there was a movie shot um, when they did the scenes, they did VR technology where they would scan the entire room so you could walk around the set. Um, and we all made jokes of, oh yeah, you're going to see a grip sitting on an apple box in a corner somewhere. You're going to see like people on the crew hiding behind doors and all the other fun stuff. Are you sure this wasn't on James Cameron's next film? <laughs> I would not I be surprised. Remember. Yeah, I mean, it's only a matter of time before we get, like, VR Pandora. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, we're always fascinated by these concepts. And then, of course, this one takes it even further because the VR concept wants to show you the real you. Uh, but it does it, it shows you the real you as if you're the victim. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I loved, I loved it. I thought it was funny. Um you're sitting there and he's got like the dominatrix crawling up to him while he's sitting there with his family on the couch. <laughs> and then you finally see his wife's and she's like wearing the little like Christmas outfit with the little, like, uh, like the pon rain poncho. And she's got her glass of wine. And I was like, yeah, get it girl. You deserve <laughs> that raise. <laughs> uh, yes, I did. I, I had a lot out of all of all the segments. I believe this is the funniest uh, for me. Um, Seth Green, like, hit it out of the park again, as yeah. usual. He does. He he's like a freaking chameleon when it comes to different types of characters. Uh, he's played the characters the the overly confident and funny ones, like in the television version of It. Uh, you know, he's played bad boys. Uh, he's done he's, a little bit of everything. So yeah, he's had a possessed hand. It's been great. That's right. Idle hands for everyone who doesn't know the reference. Idle hands. You should definitely see that one too. I forget about that one. That one's actually really funny too. Yeah, it's great. Um, looking up the director for this one, I was a little disappointed that this was all we got, knowing his background, because he did Legion, Dark Skies, and Priest. And I was like, those are phenomenal movies. Like this, we 
we get jingle all the way and then like he uh he actually co-founded a um la fx company that did a bunch of stuff ranging from like mars attacks to grindhouse iron man pirates of the caribbean movies harry potter stuff like that so knowing that he's part of that world too it was like oh i would have loved to see how much more he could have done if he had anything else interesting yep (laughs) uh all right so uh any final thoughts on uh that one before we move on it was probably the funniest out of all of us oh no it was definitely the funniest. like yeah actually makes you laugh out loud uh, and actually, because it's positioned where it is, it's actually a good lead into the final one. Um, you go, you go from, I guess when you when you when you're putting these together, you kind of put the ones that are just mediocre in be- in the in the middle, and that's yeah. how I thought the Halloween one. And then you put you come back with a really funny one with this one, <laughs> and then of course we're going to end with New Year's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, which is. Uh so well done it's so funny and smart as well uh <laughs> so uh, I'll, 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 uh it is and it's it's funny because and i know there is i guarantee you the filmmakers were not thinking about this when they were making this movie i at least i hope not but i was thinking about this when i was re-watching it because i could i the only thing i could think about is if this was um uh, uh, the the really bad version of bateman from american psycho it's, it's the ineffectual. Really... This is the uh, this is the ineffectual version of him. That's that's yeah. how he. You know, uh, Bateman is like this clean cut, preci- precise killer, and this guy has really fucked up teeth. He talks about the victim with having the perfect teeth. He wants to see the perfect teeth, and he can't seem to get the gun to work. Oh and... my god, the gun part was so funny, and I'm sitting there like, what is this guy doing? He literally just put the bullet in. We literally have a Chekhov's gun for the rest of this. <laughs> um, but going off of the teeth thing, I thought it was so funny because you know, like she's showing this clean exterior, but she's just as dirty as he is on the inside. And the same thing shows at the zoom out of her apartment at the end is you've got the main room that's nice and clean. And as they slowly zoom out to the other room, it's all decrepit and gross. And there's like gore slipping down the walls. And you're like, okay, she's just as gross as he is. I mean, she does have a a medicine cabinet full of like eyeballs, but who doesn't? Uh, That's why I was saying, I was like, I didn't see this the first time I saw it, but for some reason I was stuck on just seeing uh, Patrick Bateman in American Psycho. And I was like, (laughs) oh my God. Uh, And I really found this a hell of a lot funnier the second time i saw it oh yeah um i can't yeah the fact that he's so ineffectual with killing uh the very first victim with the gun in the very beginning and then <laughs> and I, I, become... I love that we get the photo album of all the holidays they spent together it's like we're recapping the entire movie yes I, that's why i said this was a perfect ending for the entire anthology it kind of sums up everything i was like oh yeah and that's one of the things why i'm not sure if any of these people talk to each other while they were making the movie uh, because the, the way the sequence of all of them is the flow um, yes. is very well done. And that's not always the case with anthology films. It could, yeah, that's something that's not always the case. <laughs> yes. But no, this one was, I thought it was pleasantly funny i mean a lot of the comment or the quotes from this like tonight at midnight i want to kiss someone who makes me feel like i can take the tape off their lips and then like she's sitting there with her ice cream and you're like oh this poor girl and she's like well can't be worse than the last one we matched at 96 percent." and you're like the first time you're like oh i hope she doesn't get murdered by this guy and then the second time you're watching it and you're like oh god this is gonna be a match made in heaven yeah i know uh yeah and this is it's more this it, overall this whole not, and not just this segment it's much more rewarding the second time watching it um because of all of these little things that we now know having seen it the first time yes absolutely you can look at the little things like i didn't i don't think i saw it the first time when they did the zoom out of the next room where you could see all the like blood marks on the walls but yeah i mean the fact that she has like a specialty jar made just for him with his name on it no and then yet again, he brings out the gun and he's loaded it wrong. 
<laughs> you would think that by now he would just put bullets in the whole in every chamber. You would think, but then he also left it in the bath or outside the bathroom, and then she he looks at the like print on the on the tub and he's like, Oh, this is so cute and sweet. And then he finally decides to open it and it's just body bags. <laughs> and then she comes charging in like Patrick Bateman with the axe, and you're like, Well, here we go. Got the nice countdown to the new year, and there's a nice soft thud at the end at midnight, and she starts dancing with her ex. I'm like, it's it's a beautiful ending. She found true love. It's a beautiful ending. Not only to that segment, but I think the whole film as a whole. It really is. All right. Uh, so um, that being said, now that we've discussed all of the segments and holidays, what are your thoughts overall for the entire film? Uh I really think it's an enjoyable film. It's really fun. There are some really good hits and some misses. Um, but overall, it's it's a great thing to experience. Okay. So I'm going to uh, lead out for this in the fact that I really think that the film does a really good job with where the, each segment is positioned in the film, which I have seen a lot of anthology movies. I've seen a lot of low-budget ones <laughs> and no-budget ones. And the way in which these are in line, their order, their sequence, uh, works really well for the overall film. Um, sometimes with uh, ABCs of Death, I didn't always get that. But that's because each one of the segments are just kind of the filmmaker doing whatever the hell they want to do with that segment. And they don't have a lot of time. Um, with this one, they all pretty much are about the same length. Uh, there are a couple that are weaker because you wish that they expanded them more. Mm -hmm. um but overall with the accession of kevin smith <laughs> the production quality is excellent unless of course he was going for the grungy uh porno flick uh they were all really well done and for fans of gore there's a lot of gore surprisingly in this movie uh <laughs> but there's also a lot of different types of horror in here we've mentioned the body horror we've mentioned you know the religious type of horror that's in here cult horror or paganism um it's a uh, this is an anthology that has a little bit of everything in there in terms of being able to be accessible to horror fans who just like a little bit of everything um i think yeah, it's it's, so. it's a great collection of uh, i mean nothing really has to tie together but it does kind of tie together well, I'm surprised they haven't done a sequel yet. I hope they do. Uh, or do one in which they highlight some of the other ones. I would love to see an Arbor Day yeah. film or... <laughs> Just a giant tree eating people. Or well, we, man eating yeah. trees. Yeah, they didn't do Thanksgiving. They could do Thanksgiving. Well, There's... we've got an entire movie now for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I mean, we've had movies for Thanksgiving. And I was like, you can't compare to that either. Like, you're going to do the exact same thing. <laughs> So uh, with that, I would love to thank Sarah for joining us for this conversation in horror. Um, this is uh, this is not just a regular episode. This is one that we want to celebrate uh, Valentine's Day and everyone out there who just loves a good horror film. So if you're watching this, make sure to appreciate your loved ones, even if you are Jason or uh, Patrick Bateman. Uh, uh and uh watch all of the, the segments they are actually really good and this film is uh one of those films that you can watch in any holiday pretty much so i want to thank you all for joining us for conversation horror please check out some of our previous episodes and uh make sure to subscribe to us so you can get uh ahead on some of our future episodes and i would like to say good night everyone or a good day and uh, have fun Conversations in Horror is a Broken Lighthouse Pictures production produced by Kevin L. Powers, executive produced by Kelly A. Inoka, and originally filmed via Zoom technology. Conversations in Horror is hosted by Kevin L. Powers and co-hosted by various horror film lovers and filmmakers. To learn more about Mr. Powers, please make sure to check out his Patreon page and other social media platforms. Conversations in Horror is copyright 2024, Broken Lighthouse Pictures production.